Good evening. This is a virtual meeting of the North Andover Board of Health, Thursday, January the 28th, a little after 7 p.m. because I've had computer problems. I'm Joe McCarthy, board chairman, and there is a quorum. Uh, board members in attendance are Michelle Davis, clerk, Dr. Patrick Scanlon, town doctor, Daphne LaFleur, and Dr. Max Tolson. Department members in attendance are Brian Lagrasse, director, Callan Iberson, town nurse, and Tony Wolferden, town assistant. Uh, the first order of business is the following governor's statement, which has to be read at virtual meetings. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the North Andover Board of Health will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information in the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website at www.northandoverma.gov. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to watch the meeting may do so on their television by tuning to Comcast Channel 8 or Verizon Channel 26 or online at www.northandovercam.org. No in-person attendance or member of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of North Andover website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. If the public would like to participate, please email your question comments prior to or during the meeting to blagrass at North Andover ma.gov, that is B-L-A-G-R-A-S-S-E at North Andover ma.gov. The question comment will be read during the proceedings and responded to accordingly. I do hope we have live meetings soon because this statement leaves much to be desired, but that's another issue. Um, the, the topic of discussion is the coronavirus and the vaccine. And we'll start with Brian and his staff. And amongst other things, they'll discuss how our town will help seniors get their vaccinations. Uh, then other board members and I will provide additional information. If time permits, I'll also highlight an article on the similarities and differences between the coronavirus and the flu, um, then present virus-related questions which may have been received from town residents. Um, for those of you listening and who are not familiar with our board meetings, I just want to say that, uh, that during this review discussion, any department or board member may add further insight. At that, Brian, it is all yours. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we did get one public comment prior to the meeting. Um, this is from Thomas Duggan at... Uh, 48 Beacon Hill Boulevard. Good afternoon. I have a few comments related to COVID-19. I am a resident. Take the address. It says, to better understand the ongoing response to this pandemic, can the Board of Health answer or otherwise address the following questions? To date, how many doses of vaccine have been distributed to the town by state, federal agencies, or other parties? Um, to answer that question, we've gotten through our supply of um, so 100 doses so far for police, fire, emergency management, and the clinic and nursing staff. We do have other doses on hand that are scheduled to be issued next week to a long-term care facility. And we are ordering as much as we can, which has been capped at 100 doses per week for the next several weeks. Um, hopefully they can ramp that up a little bit and give us more at a later date. Um, so is the list recipients a public record? It's not because it's... Um, uh, medical information, so we cannot provide an outline on who's received doses, but police, fire, uh, emergency management, as well as clinic staff. 
have received the doses already. So is there a plan to distribute 100 doses of vaccine per week that the town will receive going forward? Yes, we are working on a plan to get that out as soon as possible. Um, however, it is hampering us with the amount of people we can give it to. If it's only limited at 100, because clinics are a lot of work, and 100 doses can go pretty quickly. Um, the last question is, this number is mentioned by the time manager here at the most recent FinCon meeting, as our allotment of the vaccine in the state. The Boston Globe, New York Times, and the media articles about unused vaccine in higher education and private institutions. Is the Board of Health or health agents aware of any in-town private educational institutions, primary, secondary, or higher stockpiling vaccine? Uh, no, there is no uh, institution in town stockpiling vaccine. Um, so that answers the next question. And what is the Board of Health doing to coordinate with those entities? We are in regular discussions with those entities about partnering up, being able to issue or administer more vaccine if possible. So constant contact with various entities in town, including the schools, such as Merrimack and Brooks, about getting their staff and their students uh, taken care of when appropriate. So that was a public comment. Anybody have any questions on that regarding Thomas Duggan's questions and answers? Okay, I will go into my brief update. Um, so basically an update on the numbers to start off with is obviously the trends are starting to go down, which is really good. Uh, Massachusetts in general, back on January 4th, had over 9,000 positive cases that day. The 11th was down to 6,500, the 19th down to 5,300. Uh, earlier this week on the 25th, it was down to 2,393. Today was up a little bit to 4,200, but it's still way down from the post-holiday surge we saw, where it was over 9,000 a day for several days. Um, hospitalizations are turning down as well, and we're at 1878 in Massachusetts. Uh, that includes testing at 116,000 tests uh, today, and a positivity rate of 4.44%, which is down from almost 8% a few weeks ago. So. That seems to be going well. Um, North Ann our numbers are also trending down as well. Um, just over the last week and a half, we've seen a dramatic decrease. <laughs> Sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, after the, the holiday surge we saw, we were seeing over 40 cases a day. We're down to now down to between 10 and 20 a day. Uh, we've cut that in half, which is really good. Um, we've also moved back into the yellow as a risk category, according to the state DPH map, with a positive testing rate of 4.74%. Um, currently, we have 148 active cases in town, and that's down from over 250. So that's been cut down by a good portion. Uh, Alec Caroline talked a little bit more about uh, anything like that, if she has that on her docket for tonight. Um, I'll also let her get into more detail in the clinics as well. But so far we've completed our first responders, uh, their first shots, um, and we are scheduling the second shots for the first responders now. Uh, this includes police, fire, EMS, emergency management, and all the vaccinators. Oh, I'll get a visitor in the background here. <laughs> um, so we're also in the planning stages for our seniors. Um, we do have doses to assist a long-term care facility who couldn't get all of their residents done um, yet. So we're gonna help them out next week. And phase two opens up for seniors, 75 and over on Monday. Um, so that's the first tier of phase two, 75 and over. Then it goes on to 65, as well as um, people with comorbidities, and then down through the different tiers in phase two. Uh, we have sent out information on that through the town websites, um, as we had hoped to and planned on doing things a little bit uh, larger uh, and having more clinics and but our vaccine allotment was cut down from the state uh, we were planning on a lot more but we've been capped at 100 for the next couple of weeks until they can get more supply and more vaccine um, we are a registered provider with the state we do have everything geared up and ready to go um, we just need the vaccine that's the, the, the sole limiting factor at this point um, it's, also, it's very frustrating because we had big plans, I think, and there was a lot of excitement once the vaccine was shipped out and we started to um, plan clinics. Uh, the state has set up multiple mega vaccination sites across the state, 
the closest one to us is the Danvers and Middleton Doubletree Hilton Hotel. Um, and that is eligible for anybody in phase one and then tier one of phase two, which is people over 75. And that opens on February 3rd, which is this coming Wednesday. Uh, Mass has set up their 211 information line to assist people, but I think they don't really have the capacity built up in that system yet. So it might take a long time to get a call back. And I don't know what their uh, actual limitations are at this point, but they are getting that ramped up to assist with the rollout of phase two. Um, obviously, you guys have seen the news, and me and Joe have had some conversations on this this past week about how difficult it is for people to sign up to, uh, at some of these sites. Um, we don't have any clinics set up just at this point yet, but we'll also have online registration as well for our clinics, which, depending on the population you're reaching out to, can have some difficulties. So um, we met today with the COVID task force in town, and we are really looking to ramp up an assistance program for anybody who wants to get the vaccine. So we've partnered up with all the department heads to get some staff and set up a call center per se, where people can call in, they can help get registered for a clinic. Uh, we can get their information so we can call them and help them register for one of our clinics when we have the vaccine and have things scheduled. Also looking into what their limitations are in terms of transportation and any factors that may come into play with them getting to a clinic. Um, we're going to do various types of uh, notifications in terms of phone calls, actually calling out to seniors. We're going to do postcards for the mail. They're going to be able to call us. And we're going to get as much as we can through the next week or so. We're going to start this next week and get this up and running as soon as possible so that everybody can at least get their voice heard and get on a list and know that we are looking out for them. I think that's one of the big things. And that's our focus through this next little tier, this next phase. 75 and then 65 then we do have future plans down the road to do the rest of phase two and then into phase three and phase two includes uh, your educators from early education through uh, all the way through high school as well as the administrative staff uh, public works infrastructure food workers uh, and right on down the line so all we need is vaccine we're ready to go this is the light at the end of the tunnel that we've been waiting for for a long time and I think we're just about there. We just have to keep plugging away at it and keep reaching out and helping the people that need it to move forward. Uh, I'm going to pass this off to Caroline. She's got a lot more information and can give you some more details on the clinics and all that kind of fun stuff. Thanks, Brian. Um, so to echo kind of what Brian said, we finished our first responders. We had... Um, a few larger clinics a couple of weeks ago, and then the group of first responders that weren't able to get vaccinated that week, we were able to finish them off this week. Um, and so we're working on scheduling uh, the first round of second doses uh, in a couple of weeks from now, uh, coordinating with, you know, just trying to figure out as far as scheduling the clinics, you know, because it, we have to, when we order the vaccine, we just actually started our first order last week was our first official order. The first order came through a regional order for uh, first responders. So, you know, we have to coordinate, make sure we hold on to those second doses for um, everyone that's already been vaccinated and um, just trying to navigate around the best way to get our senior population vaccinated because we have, you know, logistically some challenges around vaccinating because we have everything as far as the registration has to go online so we have a new system that the state wants us to use and so the registration the insurance piece the consent is all online so um, we're trying to you know figure out the best way to roll that out because not everyone has internet access not everyone's great on the computer uh, some people are legally blind you know um, there's many many obstacles to that and then the other piece will be home visits and um, homebound seniors who need to be vaccinated at some point and how we work around that because of the fragility of the vaccine. Once we puncture the vial, we have to use it within six hours. They don't want us to transport it once the vial's been punctured. And, um, and then you have to wait around for 15 or 30 minutes depending on um, you know past, uh, past reactions um, to monitor for any type of reaction after the vaccine. So logistically, it's just a lot of lot to consider and we're trying to figure out the best way to um to do this um and still 
doing contact tracing and <laughs> So mostly the CTC, the, con the state contact tracers is taking over the bulk of the contact tracing in town just because our efforts and time have been really uh, changed over here to the vaccine. So um, when numbers really started to pick up in the D, you know, I guess it was right after Thanksgiving, the contact tracers have been doing the bulk of the work. Um, the school nurses have been phenomenal um, to help out with anything that you know comes across their desks, and so um, it's really been a, a team effort, for sure. Definitely, That's and uh, you know, I, I forgot to mention, I did reach out, or I did get a phone call from the Housing Authority, uh, Maggie over there, she's doing a great job, and she wants to partner up on senior housing and getting them taken care of. So I'm not sure what that looks like at this point. I do know that if we enter into an agreement with them, we may be able to up our allotment through their organization to get vaccines specifically targeted for senior housing. So I don't know the details on that yet, but that is definitely in the forefront and the populations that we want to get to first uh, and take care of right away. So I'll have more on that at the next meeting or I'll even be in contact with Joe uh, on a regular basis as this unfolds. I've also spoken to the CVS from uh, pharmacy manager they are waiting for their vaccine as well, and they hope they will be rolling out um, phase two vaccinations in the very near future. They were supposed to get vaccine on the 18th. That didn't happen. She's still waiting anxiously and wants to um, let us know what's going on with them so we can also help get the word out when they get their vaccine as well. So there's some avenues that are going to be opening up soon. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Um, I think we're on the same boat at this point, and uh, we can move forward with this as soon as possible. Back to you, Joe. Yeah, just, uh, just a couple of big comments. Uh, certainly helping seniors to, to sign up, it's huge. And I know you and I and other people in our town have been pushing to do precisely that. And our town manager, Melissa Rodriguez says, uh, we're gonna do it and we're gonna make it happen. And it's going to be real soon. Uh, the only other town or city that I'm aware of right now in, in Massachusetts that help the seniors to sign up is, is Revere. Uh, so, we're at the, so we're at the top of the curve to do, uh, to do precisely this. I, I want to go over some numbers which will only emphasize how important it is for us to help our seniors. Uh, in Massachusetts, seniors in nursing homes, assisted living communities, prisons, and homeless shelters who have wanted to be vaccinated have received, received a vaccine shot. And as just stated, as of yesterday, all other seniors aged 75 or older, and there are about 450,000 seniors 75 years of age or older in Massachusetts. They can sign up on the state's website that is, uh, this website is uh, mass, mass gov, M A S S G O V. Uh, as of, they can sign up and, as you just said, be vaccinated as, uh, as soon as February the 3rd. However, the state statistics show that about 42% of seniors 75 years of age or older don't even have access to Wi Fi. And many of them don't even have friends or relatives to help them sign up. So this is where our town comes in as one of the last resorts. And we're going to do it. And we're going to make it happen. And uh, to you, Brian, and uh, to you, Catlin, and others in our department, and your department, uh, kudos, a job, uh, job well done. This is very, very, very important. Um, I want to go over a few other things too uh, concerning the um, uh, the virus and the vaccine. And uh, there's an article in uh, in the recent Mayo Clinic Health Letter on the similarities and differences between the coronavirus and the flu. And as we know, they're both viruses. And I want to quickly go over the similarities and the differences. And then continue the discussion. And I too have some questions and answers that have been uh, brought to my attention that I want to roll out uh, to our department and to other members of, uh, of our board. But the similarities 
The symptoms include, and, and uh, several doctors on our board uh, stop me anytime, but the symptoms include uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, tiredness, sore throat, and running or stuffing nose. Now, these are similarities that I'm talking about. An infection with either virus can range in severity from no symptom to mild or severe symptom or symptoms. It's hard to diagnose what virus you may have based upon symptoms alone, so testing is necessary. Both can lead to serious complications such as pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, organ failure, heart attack, heart and brain inflammation, stroke, in death, the differences, and this is one that I did not realize until I uh, and, until I, uh, I I did some reading. Uh, the COVID nineteen it may cause loss of taste or smell. That's a difference between COVID nineteen and the flu. COVID nineteen symptoms may generally appear two to fourteen days after exposure. Flu symptoms usually appear about one to four days after exposure. COVID-19 appears to be more contagious and to spread more quickly than the flu. As a matter of fact, um, I had read earlier today uh, that the new strain from England is four times as contagious as the strain that we have now. Uh, severe illness such as lung injury is more frequent with COVID-19 than with the flu. The mortality rate is also higher with COVID-19 than the flu. I didn't realize that. Uh, COVID-19 can cause complications such as blood clots, clots and are difficult uh, from, uh, and are different than, uh, than flu complications. Uh, so I thought that that was of interest and I certainly wanted to, uh, I wanted to read that to all that may be listening uh, right now. Uh, I wanna move on, unless there's further comment, I want to move on to some of the questions that I that I have received uh, from from people in town too. Um, Brian, this is this is primarily to you. Why has mass been so slow to vaccinate healthy seniors over 65? When the vaccination of healthy seniors in states such as California, Florida, New York, and New Hampshire is already well underway. And I mention those states because I have friends and relatives that are healthy, over 65 and all of them, that have already been vaccinated. So what's happening in, in Massachusetts regarding that, Brian? Do you know? Or, or, or maybe one other member of the board would want to comment on that. Um, I'll let two of our esteemed doctors comment on that. But um, I think one of the things is the states can decide how they distribute the vaccine. The federal government gives them a certain number as an allotment. Then the state determines how that's distributed. Our state has chosen a tiered phase structure um, to hit some of the most vulnerable as well as the people that are exposed the most. I think it's the number one factor they went to, who's exposed the most. You've got your healthcare workers with COVID facing um, and COVID facing environments as well as first responders. Um, so that's how they did the, the first phase. Second phase is now going into your highly settled populations, such as people over 75, then over 65. So, yeah, 1.5 million people in phase one in Massachusetts. So that's a pretty large number. And I've gotten ver various reports and numbers from different sources as to how many vaccines have been given. Um, earlier in the week, DPH said they've already given out and administered seven, almost 750,000 doses, uh, which is only about half of phase one but they are moving into phase two at this point. Uh, You're talking so, about those are the doses in Massachusetts, correct? correct. Yep. Uh, and, 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 and I had also read too that, uh, that many people that are eligible, phase one, to receive the uh, vaccine have uh, opted not to receive the vaccine. One number I read is as high as 40%. Of course, I'm always suspect of what I read, whether it's true or not. And by the way, yeah. Brian, what you just said about why we are behind other other states in uh, rolling out this vaccine to seniors over 65, um, 
I read what you just said, but um, I, there's so much information out there, and it yeah. changes. Things to be changing so rapidly that I scratch my head and say, "Well, I'm really not sure." So I think I'll bring it up at the uh, at, at at the board of health meeting. Yeah, so uh, I think just, you know, I just think some states took the approach to go for age, other states took the approach to go for occupation and exposure. So you got two different ways of thinking about it, a structured phase tiered setup and way to roll it out may be slower because you have to hit those targeted tiered populations first. But I mean, we can look back on this and analyze all the data and everything after this is over, it's kind of all rolling out at the same time. So one person does it one way, one person does it another way, which one's better, I, I, I don't know. Um, it all depends on what your philosophy is, I guess. And I'll definitely refer this question to Pat and um, Max. I actually don't have, uh, I explained it pretty well. I don't have much more to add on that one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing, the only thing that I can possibly add to this is that um, the Boston area specifically has an enormous number of healthcare providers and a density that's not similar to almost anywhere else in the country. So if you're going to, and, and I mean, just, just, just as an example, in the Longwood Medical Area alone, that's the, the Beth Israel, the Brigham, and Children's Hospital, there are over um, uh, 80,000 people that work there in direct patient-facing, or at least research, and then therefore secondarily patient-facing positions. So you're going to suck up a ton of vaccine and a ton of healthcare resources immunizing that enormous um, population of people who, who treat other people so the hospital the, the hospital density in boston my guess is sucked up a lot of the vaccine right at the beginning mm -hmm. um, i don't think that they I, I don't think that massachusetts by state ways got fewer vaccine doses than anybody else by population and i think that the the governor's decision to immunize um patient facing healthcare workers first in nursing home residents along in, in tier one i think that's mirrored and, and first responders is mirrored almost universally across the board. Uh, that, that number that you just uh, gave us, Brian, uh, over 700 people in Massachusetts uh, have been vaccinated phase one. Uh, that's uh, said about 12% 12, uh, 12 of the population or so in, in the state. Uh, nationally, it's about 7.2% of the population has already been vaccinated. So if these numbers are real, uh, we are indeed ahead of the curve as far as as far as vaccine vaccinations in 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 Massachusetts. And that's uh, what DPA said on Tuesday. Seven hundred and forty-eight thousand yeah. is what the, they said on the webinar I was on. The news had five hundred thousand uh, as of yesterday. I'm going to go with DPH on this one. Um, so. Yeah, as I said, there's a lot of information out there that's that's inconsistent, which is why I'm bringing up, and other people are bringing up some of these items too during this uh, meeting. I'd also read that the vaccines in phase two and phase three, uh, twenty percent of them are being set aside for communities that have high positive uh, rates, uh, which is which is certainly understandable. Uh, but that means that it's going to be uh, arguably that much more difficult for. Uh, certainly seniors to be uh, to be vaccinated because 20 percent of the vaccines are going uh, are going elsewhere uh, and then again that information may be incorrect but that's what i that's what i read uh brian uh any vaccines any, any wastage at all in uh, in north andover because I, I i had read that once you open up the bio we've, we've given more dose than we were actually issued <laughs> Um, so no, there's no waste at all. Um, some of the some of the vials we've gotten 11 doses out of. Um, you're only supposed to get 10, but there's always a little extra in there. So we've gotten 11 doses out of several of the vials, which is good. So we've been able to do additional clinic staff and things like that. So what do you do before you open a vial? You 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 uh, you see to it and assure that there are enough people to be vaccinated so that the vaccine is not wasted. The way that we're, we've been doing it is we've scheduled everything out in the right multiples of 10 at each clinic. And then ah. if there's a few extra, you, you get people that have been at the clinic or on standby, um, usually the workers and people that have been helping the clinic, if they want it, then there's an extra dose and they can get it. 
so I have a wait list there. of Joe. So Go Joe, ahead, I have um, it creates. It's a lot of planning, and so it's um, because we know that we're going to get an extra dose, and it's not out of every vial because it has to be a full dose. It can't be like 0. 0.4 mLs. It has to be a, a full 0. 0.5 mLs. Um, on average, maybe five or six of the vials out of 10 vials will give us that extra dose. So I have um, a list of people that are in the phase. So if we're vaccinating police and fire, you know, the nurses who are vaccinating them are considered um, eligible to get that vaccine. And so um, for whatever reason, if they're healthcare, you know, forward fa uh, COVID facing or by the means of just vaccinating at the clinic, um, but then also any clinic staff. And then we, I also had a wait list of, um, I had Meals on Wheels, you know, people who are doing home um, deliveries into homes. I vaccinated a couple of those staff members. I had some home PT and OT um, based workers that were also on my wait list. So that's kind of how we're trying to, to navigate around that. Yeah, we're really uh, encouraged to keep it within the, the current phase that we're in. You don't want to really step out of that because then there's a lot of um, finger pointing and people, you know, talk about it. And we want to do everything by the book and the tiers that we're in and keep things above board. And nobody wants to be on the front page of the paper for doing something wrong or I mean, losing a thousand doses of vaccine. Or actually, I think the, uh, the VA made uh, national news last week. Um, so we're going to try to avoid all of that. Yeah, it also no one is cleaning my uh, office. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have no refrigerators unplugged. <laughs> I was going to say I also read that uh, that that many hospitals and so forth uh, have so many shots because so many people there are not uh, getting them. They just don't want them. That the uh, that the government is is holding back on uh, delivery of uh, vaccines. I haven't said that. It appears that there are, uh, let me put it this way, uh, a lot, maybe hundreds of thousands of vaccines uh, that, are, that are there being stored right now in Massachusetts and, and not for the second shot. But yeah. and, and DBH, I read a lot, and I don't know. I don't yeah, know. no, DBH had said on Tuesday uh, on one of the webinars that I was on that they've given out 98% of the vaccine they've received. So nothing is being held back. It's all being shipped out as they get it. They're not. Well, they probably stockpiled a little bit for the mass vaccination sites to come up, but those are probably pre-scheduled and pre-planned as part of their allotment, which is why they cut back on some of the local public health and some of the other uh, venues reducing their uh, dose allotment. But they indicated they've given out 98% of the vaccine they've received so far. It's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's amazing the information and misinformation that is out there, but I hope you are correct. That'd be, that'd be terrific. Another question for you, uh, Brian, is uh, what businesses, particularly restaurants in North Andover, have been temporarily or permanently shut down because of this uh, virus? Um, off the top of my head, I'm going to lean towards Howling Wolf, and I believe that is it, it's, uh, Fuddruckers, and I believe possibly, but this might have been before, this was a, a Charma or a Karma Grill off of uh, First and Main. But I think that was part of the gas. And then they had a water main issue and then COVID hit. So they were just at their wits end at that point. And that's it. Is you see it right um, now? Yep. That's not bad. Considering that uh, that they're talking about, say, for New York City, 30% of the restaurants are never reopening again. So that, that's not bad at all. I also have a few questions that have been brought to my attention uh, for, for the doctors on our board. Um, well, this one here I'll answer because I read the answer in the paper today. The question was, should a person who has the virus get vaccinated? And the answer is yes. Uh, but wait 90 days. And again, if the doctors, if you disagree, uh, let me know. But I did not know that. You can get vaccinated if you've had the virus, but wait 90 days. Um, You're correct. What's that? You're correct. Uh, That's what the CDC another, recommendations are. 
Another question of uh, the doctors, upon vaccination, how, if at all, would one know if they can catch or transmit the virus? Um, is that kind of more like a mask? Um, kind of going back to that we still have, should be wearing masks no. and, uh, or I mean, just in general? Yeah, in general, like if you're vaccinated, you know, can you still catch uh, the virus? Uh, can you transmit the virus? If yes, and yes. Um, that's the short answer. The long answer is that um, you, we, the data is still out there as far as um, whether or not um, we can transmit the, the virus if you've been vaccinated. Um, there is certainly a, there is still a risk that you can transmit it. Uh, you almost in a sense be colonized and transmit that um, even if you're vaccinated to a potentially unvaccinated person. That's why we have to wear masks. Um, and, uh, you know, Moderna and Pfizer are only, I, sh I shouldn't say only, are 90, 95% effective. So there is still a risk of getting um, COVID, but the symptoms are, um, are much more minimal based on the clinical trials from both uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, do you see the need for, say, a, a booster shot uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, the new virus strain that's, that soon will be hitting, or has already hit our country from Great Britain? Um, actually, both um, pharmaceutical companies have done studies, and both have deemed, uh, I think, Pfizer's a little bit more effective against the mutated strains, including South Africa and um, in England. Um, Moderna, but Moderna came out today, I believe, and said that they were, it was still effective. Uh, viruses mutate all the time. This is something that's not uncommon. And um, the vaccine makers have taken all this into account. Maybe down the road, we might have to have a booster vaccine, kind of like the way we get a flu shot every year. Um, but I'm sure some pharmaceutical company will ultimately blend the flu vaccine and a COVID vaccine together and we get it all in one shot. Um, but hmm. uh, I think it's still too early to tell ultimately how long the immunity we have for the vaccine and if and when we need to get another booster. But I think the focus right now is trying to get everybody immune initially and we go from there. Have tested for the virus shortly after being vaccinated. Would the test be positive? And if positive, should one be concerned? I'll let Max go on that one. I'm sharing the wealth, Max. I'm sharing the wealth. Oh, that, that's fine. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, so, so don't forget that this, this um, vaccine is remarkable and that it is not the virus. This, this vaccine is a piece of genetic material that your body, trans, that your body then creates a response to um, and then creates a, an ability to protect itself from the most infectious piece of the virus if you ever get exposed to it again. So you are not getting exposed to virus. You're not getting exposed to a piece of the virus. You're getting exposed to a piece, a very small piece of genetic material that is non-infectious. So if you test positive for COVID after you've received the vaccine, it's because you were exposed to COVID before you got the vaccine. Uh. Or... Or, as Pat said, it's because you're part of the very unlucky 5% of people for whom the vaccine didn't work. So you cannot, you cannot get COVID from the vaccine. You cannot spread COVID because you've received the vaccine. You may have some symptoms of the vaccine, like everyone gets from the flu sometimes with a sore arm. Or you may even get some reactions by having a fever for a short time or feel a little crummy for a couple hours. But typically... Um, those all go away in a very short period of time. You cannot get COVID from the vaccine, and you can't spread it from the vaccine. Now, that's, that's interesting, uh, and I believe you. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, Max and I had a pretty good discussion earlier this past week. He gave me a good education on this uh, vaccine. Uh, but I had also read and heard on TV that, uh, that they're unsure if you can spread it, 
so please, please, even back, please. What, what are you talking about? Are you saying that you can't, you can't spread? What? I'm sorry, Joe. I'm just trying to understand what, what you, what you heard. In other words, if, back, if you're vaccinated, you just said if you're vaccinated, you cannot spread it to someone else. No, 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 no. That's not what I said, Joe. Well, what I'm, I said. Understood was, you. I'm glad I asked. If, if you, if you get, if you're, if, if you receive the vaccine, you are not infected with the virus. The vaccine will not infect you with the virus. Most of the time, as as Pat said, most of the time, 90 to 90, 95% of the time, you are protected from getting infected with the virus with the vaccine. But there's still a chance that you could get infected with the virus if you're exposed to it, and your body will fight it off much better than it would have if you hadn't received the vaccine. So if, if you get the vaccine, you could still be infectious if you got exposed to the native vaccine. Like if I was in a room eating dinner with somebody who had the vaccine and, uh, and who, had, who had the virus, virus. If, I, if I was exposed, to, if I was in a room eating dinner or breathed in the virus from someone who had it and I had received the vaccine, I could still potentially get the virus and then potentially transmit it. That's why masks are still important after you receive the vaccine. Mm. If I could say one thing, or echoing kind of what Max was saying, this this new mRNA vaccine is really a, a medical marvel for the modern age. Um, I mean, this is going to open up doors to other disease processes being potentially treated. I saw, I recently saw a study in, um, I believe it was in Israel, that they um, are now looking at um, being able to treat uh, multiple sclerosis because uh, with the mRNA vaccine. Um, this is a huge um, a medical marvel on how we can now vaccinate people quicker for different diseases, potentially even things like um, HIV, which was a big, um, had a big research component of mRNA vaccines. And that's why scientists knew so much about the mRNA vaccine before COVID and why we were able to make this so quickly. And just one more point on vaccinations in general, there's so much concern and a lot of it is misinformation about vaccines. Um, this vaccine has been deemed safe. It is effective. I've told, told all my patients that the FDA is probably the toughest governing body of medicine anywhere in the world to try to get medications, vaccines, medical equipment through and approved. And the fact that they approved it um, going through all the appropriate channels it has been, it's, it's safe, it's effective, and without vaccines, who knows the way humanity would be currently with the amount of vaccines that we have to be able to protect us from deadly diseases. Patrick, uh, speaking of the uh, vaccine, I uh, want to relay a little on the conversation that we had earlier this week, and you mentioned Israel, too, on, uh, on, on, on what they're seeing, because there has been a major campaign to uh, vaccinate their population. And can you want to go over the results that they've seen so far on so, that, as far as what's happening with, uh, with, the, uh, with the positive rate? So, uh, and Max, feel free to chime in too. So, I, I did read an article a few weeks ago. So, Israel is leading the world with their um, with the number of people that they're able to vaccinate and how quickly they're doing it. And over the course of three weeks, after massively vaccinating um, a fair amount of their country, they've already started to notice about a uh, I believe it's about a sixty percent decline in their COVID nineteen um, infection rate, um, and that's being attributed to how large. Um, and how quickly they're able to vaccinate their general population. Um, so again, it's just another point towards how effective um, uh, the vaccine is in fighting this disease and preventing the disease. Any other comments on that? So I think the other thing, Joe, that's super important is to recognize the that it that um, the effectiveness of a, of a vaccine is only as good as the number of people who get it. So it's it's critical that people feel comfortable with this and that they accept it, um, and that they and they not only accept it but they accept it enthusiastically as a way to um, protect not just them but as Pat was implying their whole community because the more people who get vaccinated the more the whole community becomes safe. And as you alluded to during our last meeting, 
you reach herd immunity much more quickly the more people that are vaccinated. Joe, uh, and the other? It, it, speaking of, I'm sorry, go ahead, Patrick. I, I just want to add, you know, Max and I have, have been in the hospital seeing the worst of the worst of what this um, disease can do. And it is just, um, the worst of the worst is just atrocious on all levels and what it does to your lungs, what it does to your body and how, and how just it breaks down people because they're, they're stuck in the hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks. Yes, the, the, the vast majority of the population um, get cold-like symptoms, but the, the silent carriers giving it to the elderly, the patients who are, who are obese um, and other underlying medical problems that are higher risk, it just, it, it, I don't think we can push getting vaccinated more. It's just it's so incredibly important for, to make people, to get us through this pandemic and to, so, you know, we can help people and not see more people die from this terrible illness. I have a brother-in-law that has uh, been hospitalized for over a month, much of that time in a coma because of the, uh, the virus. Uh, he's 74, had been in good health, and he was uh, discharged, fortunately, today. <sighs> when you are that sick for such a long time, I had read that it can, although the results are preliminary, but it can have a devastating effect upon your body. Would either one of you comment on that? Patrick or Max? Yeah, Patrick, you're the ICU doctor. I will let you take that one. Sorry, I lost my earbuds. Can you uh, repeat that one? Uh, yes, uh, as, uh, as I just said, uh, a brother-in-law of mine, uh, he's been in a coma and uh, he's been hospitalized with the virus for over a month. He was released today, and I had read that uh, uh, that if you're really sick with this virus, it can it, it can have catastrophic effect upon other organs. Although the results are preliminary, but uh, can you comment on that, Patrick? Um, yeah, we're actually um, I believe Tufts is doing it. Um, uh, our pra our practice is uh, in the process of developing it and seeing um, patients with. Um, for the lack of a better word, uh, you know, post-COVID syndrome. Um, one major effect is the profound inflammation that the virus causes uh, on the lungs. Um, I tell my patients, inflammation goes away, scarring does not go away. Um, mm -hmm. the, the thing is, is if you have persistent inflammation within the lungs, that can lead to scarring and that could make you more short of breath, can make you need extra oxygen, um, other symptoms, it can affect the heart. It can cause inflammation of the heart. Um, for all the Red Sox fans, Eduardo Rodriguez had that effect called myocarditis, which is just inflammation of the heart muscle. That has been shown to go away, but the biggest thing that we're seeing um, is the um, persistence of things like shortness of breath and causing, uh, and, it, and a lot of that has to do with not, not so much the the virus and the active infection, but then the virus causes the body to go into a very rapid immune response causing, because the body thinks it's trying to fix itself, but instead it's just causing more inflammation. And with this virus, the lungs seem to be the big culprit. And um, it's causing patients who were marathon runners before they got the infection to you know, become short of breath after only a few steps or requiring extra oxygen. Um, and um, we're actually trying to work on following a lot of these patients upon discharge from the hospital to see how they do and to help them with you know, physical therapy, pulmonary rehab, uh, things like that, to help them try to get back on track and to start to feel better. Wow. wow. I have one other question. Uh... Uh, hoarding, or hurting, I should say, uh, from vaccination or, or uh, uh, a contagion. Uh, what? And I know we don't know, but and this is to the doctors in particular. When do you think this will happen, based upon what we know 
today. In other words, when will our country be back to the new norm, whatever that name means? Your turn, Max. So my strong hope is that, um, well, first of all, Joe, as, as I said, it depends on how many people decide to accept the vaccine. Um, but my, my hope is that if you talk, if you listen to Brian, our limiting factor right now is the amount of vaccine that's available. So you get rid of that um, and everybody who wants it can get it. Um, and I think that we are going to get there by the summer. I hope that by the fall we'll have a return to much more normal living. Um, assuming that everybody everybody accepts it and Brian continues to do the amazing work that he's doing in terms of getting it to people, um, I'm looking at the fall. Interesting. Can't wait. There's so many other people. Uh, anything else? Yeah, I just want to. I just want to. I just want to report one more thing, Brian. I mean, you, I, I'm sorry. Um, I, I know that you were concerned about vaccine waste um, and wh how people deal with high numbers of vaccine, especially in the hospital setting. Yeah. Uh, so I've been talking to the people at Lawrence specifically. Lawrence has had zero wasted vaccines, and they have uh, this, this similar similar to what they have um, here in North Andover. They have a go a website that people can go to and sign up and say if they're in the phase of being immunized and there's leftover vaccine, um, they can be called when the vaccine is open if there's any left over and they can go get that spare dose. It's on the website for Lawrence General Hospital. So, Yeah, uh, yeah they, have, uh, they have a standby list um, that you can actually sign up for online. We've sent out that link a few times through the social media channels in town here because um, they did have appointments available and they open them up as they get more vaccine too, which is good. Uh, but yeah, they have a virtual waiting room you can sign up for that you can actually go there and wait. And at the end of the day, if they have leftovers, then you're first in line. Regardless of what phase you'd be in? No, you have to be in the current phase. In the current phase. Yep. Yeah. Um, Other questions, further comments? I guess to so summarize, Brian, yeah, Brian, to say that this, quick, Brian, I have one quick, Brian, Brian, I have one quick um, question for you. Sure. Let's just let's just say that the state and that the government came in with just an, uh, a bottomless volume of vaccine delivered to North Andover. What do you see as barriers um, for the delivery of vaccine in North Andover if there were no limitations to the amount of vaccine that you could get your hands on? Good question. Um, staffing. We do have a list of volunteers. We do have access to a medical reserve corps who are vetted and credentialed medical professionals that are willing to help. So it would literally be getting them on board and then getting the site set up. Once we do that, and then we have the staff, we have the traffic control, we have the site already picked out, we could ramp up. And I mean, we've done flu clinics in the past where people come through and it's not like a big mad rush or anything, maybe a little bit in the beginning, but you do 500 people in an afternoon from like five to seven. So depending on the throughput, the numbers we have, the number of vaccinators, um, if people do everything online, it could be a very, very significant number. Granted, that's a lot of work and it's a lot of uh, resources, but it would be doable. And I'll refer to Caroline. She's the expert on our clinics because she runs them all. <laughs> I was just going to say the probably the biggest obstacle because we never really had to deal with it before um, would be the online registration and just trying to manage that for populations that weren't familiar with it, and um, you know just getting the word out and trying to to have have staff available to assist. But I think as far as running clinics, um, we've done the drive-throughs. We've done you know. 500 people in two hours at the inside the field house. I mean, we have so many wonderful residents who have stepped up and volunteered, you know, months ago before we even had vaccines. So um, I feel like as far as all of that goes, you know, I feel really confident with everything. I think it's just more just kind of navigating through waters we haven't really kind of been through before and just making sure that, you know, no one gets, you know, left out and we can try to make sure we get the vaccine to everyone. 
Well, speaking of getting the vaccine to everyone, uh, I'd say the highlight of this meeting is 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 is, is the notation that uh, that indeed our town will be helping our seniors over 75 years old and soon over 65 years old to uh, to sign up. Uh, and as noted, 42% of seniors over 75 aren't, don't even have Wi Wi-Fi. So so the need is there. There are seniors, however, that are quite computer literate. And if you sign up on the town website, of course, you may not be able to get a spot that expeditiously. But if, if you sign up, uh, the sign up is, 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 from my perspective, because I've gone through it and I checked it out a number of times, it's, 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 it's simple. You go on that state website, MassGov, uh, shows a map in Massachusetts. You hit the dot where you want to be vaccinated. Uh, you hit the time slot for vaccination, which may not be available, uh, but if that is the procedure. And the last thing you do is you complete what is uh, referred to as an attestation form. Uh, it's a simple form from, uh, from the state. Uh, and on the form, your name, your email address, if you have one, your date of birth, your zip code, your signature, the date, and that's it, assuming that you are eligible to be vaccinated at that time. So you may hear a lot that it's, da it's a daunting undertaking to sign up. Uh, from my perspective, it's very, very easy if one is computer literate. At that, is there anything else? I actually have a question for uh, Brian and Caroline. Has there been any um, talk to maybe potentially partner with an organization like Meals on Wheels to have somebody travel with them as they're delivering meals to be able to um, give vaccinations within the town uh, to the elderly populations who otherwise can't get out? We have had conversations about homebound and the problem is and an issue that we would have is the monitoring period after you give them the shot. So you've got a vial of 10, but it's gonna take you time to drive out there administer the vaccine and then wait 15 or even 30 minutes. So that vial of 10 may take you 30 to 40 minutes plus per stop. Okay. So if that's the case, granted the vial won't last that long. Mm. Uh, and- Well, we've all, oh, sorry. Good, and it just, it takes up two people for an entire day to do under 10 shots. So something we've looked at and thinking about and trying to think about how to do it. And Caroline might have a better idea on that, but. Sorry, that's I had our a delay in my phone, so. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. <laughs> like, no problem. Keep trying. Um, yes, we have looked into that and we started talking about even using like the senior center van and um, having maybe even a couple nurses where we go in, we vaccinate, but then someone can stick around for 15 minutes while we go on to the next person and go pick up, you know, kind of pick up the other nurse and then go back to the other nurse. And so just trying to manage through um, how we do that. But um, we have talked about, I mean, even through it, like a food truck, like couldn't we take a food truck and, you know, kind of have like a mobile unit almost, you know? And so, um, you know, we're still, trying to work out the details of everything. But I like the Meals on Wheels idea too. It's not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Anything else? If not, we need a motion. Motion to adjourn. Did you have something else, Brian? I was going to say, um, we need to congratulate Caroline. She was voted the employee of the year for all of her hard work and dedication over the last 10 or 11 months, however long it's been, it's been forever. She has done an amazing job and uh, is definitely deserving of her, her new title. And she has a plaque and everything to prove it. Do you get a parking space closer? <laughs> she should, right? <laughs> I know. Congratulations. Well, this Congratulations. I'll just uh, thank you. Yeah. So, all right. On that note, you guys continue with your motion. Need a motion. Motion to adjourn and congratulations in the same speech. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a second? Thank you. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 
All those opposed say no. Motion passes. Good day and be safe. Thanks. And hopefully soon we can have an in-person meeting, right? Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, say hi to Carolyn. Say hi. You have to say it. She can't hear Hi. You. <laughs> are we still on or are we off? And hey, Kim, are we off? They're usually daydreaming or working the other meeting. All right. Anyway. It's just a noise <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good seeing everybody, kind of. I, I saw pictures of some of you. <laughs> I just got the P in front of me. That's about it. Yep. There you are. Hi. Good to see you. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I got my first vaccine today. Oh. Oh, that's oh nice. nice. Yep. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're working on rolling it out. Hey, Caroline. All right. Hey, you guys. Um, I definitely want to get together with you guys soon, and hopefully we can have an in-person meeting or a way late Christmas party or something. <laughs> uh, hopefully, by, <laughs> maybe Christmas hopefully in June. <laughs> have, uh, hopefully, by our next meeting, uh, uh, most of us will have received at least one uh, vaccine shot. And uh, if I have my shot by that time, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, going out with uh, with all of you. Yeah, a belated Christmas party, but it's never too drink to uh, catch up. Never too late to catch up on drinking. <laughs> never. Please, I hope this isn't. Are we being? Are we online right now? By the way. Probably. Uh, um, we Hello. might be. Um, Bill hasn't gotten <laughs> yep. back to me yet. Uh, I really. So <laughs> I just texted him. <laughs> yeah. To say we're done. <laughs> No worries. But he hasn't gotten back to me. We are officially adjourned. That's okay. That's yeah. Um, good enough. All right, and uh, I look to uh, connect with um, you guys and get more information from Pat.